Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Well, today I have the pleasure to introduce uh, my good friend and visiting seminar speaker, Dr. Fatih Nunes, who uh, is now a research associate at the University of Virginia. And uh, he works on the evolution of uh, like adaptation to highly heterogeneous environments and rapid shifts through processes similar to balance and selection that are somewhat understudied. And uh, yeah, Fatina and I started our PhDs together back at Brown University. And uh, he graduated from there with uh, David Brand. And then uh, yeah, we moved on to work on Prosopila to so kind of similar questions, but instead that much of date more than in time. And today he'll be talking to us about the pollution in bursts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank, thank you. you. And thank you to all of you for, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. And also thank you via Zoom. Uh, please let me know if there is some issue or something in sharing with Zoom, because that always happens. But, okay. So a lot of the work that I do um, is motivated by this big question in the field of population genetics of trying to understand how a species adapt to highly variable ecosystems. I ask this question because in principle, all species experience regimes of environmental heterogeneity in time and in space. And by definition, those regimes of environmental heterogeneity have the capacity to influence the long-term evolutionary dynamics of populations in very fundamental ways. Now, of course, we as biologists care a lot about those fundamental principles because that is the information that ultimately we need to contextualize the patterns of biological variation that we see in the wild. Now, from a phylogenetic perspective, however, there is a lot of nuance associated with this question. And the reason for that is that for any particular species of animals, whatever solution is more or less likely to appear to deal with these challenges of heterogeneity is an issue which is fundamentally constrained by different aspects of life history, as well as by the idiosyncratic ways in which organisms perceive changes of the environment. And while it is true that this phylogenetic level variation adds some complexity to the problem, we can leverage that by combining some of those individual observations with first principles of evolutionary biology and then build models. And then we can use those models to make generalizable predictions about the natural world. One model, which has been quite influential for the work that I've been doing over the past four years, was published by Becero and others back in 2015. And in their models, the authors try to make predictions about the world based on two important parameters of life history. The first parameter here shown on the white axis is the capacity of species to make predictions about environmental stressors. And the second parameter is shown on the left axis is this uh, concept of environmental grain. An environmental grain, for those who are not familiar with it, is the relationship that exists between the frequency or the timing of an organism's reproduction and the scales in time or space uh, of environmental variation. And so the outputs of this model are quite interesting, why well, to me, because the model suggests that if you are a species with a very coarse environmental grain, so think of your polar bears and other charismatic macrofauna. For those type of organisms, if they're really good at making predictions about the uh, regimes of environmental heterogeneity, there is a good chance that the solutions that we will observe will have or will incorporate some aspects of phenotypic plasticity. On the other hand, if they are not good at making predictions, the argument is that some aspects of bed hedging should evolve. But the model makes this really interesting prediction, which is that for organisms that have very fine levels of environmental grain, so think of your Drosophila, for example, for those organisms, no matter how good or how bad that might be at predicting changes in the environment, the solution that we should observe is adaptive tracking. In adaptive tracking, this is a really interesting process in which the strategy that organisms use to maximize their fitness is simply to engage in rapid bursts of evolution to always keep track with the change in the environment. So as indicated in this little cartoon. Now, there are some interesting implications to this model. Because for one thing, if you think about it, 
the number of species that we could theoretically argue fall within this part of the, the sort of prediction space is relatively large. And if that's the case, then it leads us to the general hypothesis that rapid adaptive evolution, and more specifically, this process of adaptive tracking should be quite ubiquitous out there in the wild. And testing this hypothesis is one of the fundamental motivations that have guided a lot of the work that I have been doing over the past couple of years. So the way that I would describe it is that a lot of the work that I'm trying to do uh, seeks to develop an integrated understanding of adaptive tracking in the wild. And there are some guiding questions which I use to do uh, the research that I do. The first one of these questions is understand the interplay that exists between a species demography and this issue of selection, particularly through the lenses of adaptive tracking. The second is understanding the environmental drivers of the process of adaptive tracking. And then finally, understanding the genetic targets, the genes, if you will, that are evolving under this process. Over the past decade, I have worked with a wide variety of organisms trying to sort of tackle some of these questions. But there have been two species in particular that have emerged as sort of the primary workhorses of the work that I do. And these species are uh, in the barnacles, as well as natural population of the model organism, Drosophila melanogaster. And I hope to tell you uh, some stories and some insights that have emerged from working on these two systems. So let's start with barnacles. Now, to talk about barnacles, I have to ask all of you to use your imagination and travel with me to the beautiful coast of Bristol, Maine, where this picture was taken. And in particular, I want you to pay attention to this area down here with those strange formations in the rock, because that's where you'll find the species that I study, St. Balanus balanoides. Now, St. Balanus balanoides has aspects of their life history that make it really cool to tackle this question. And I'm gonna tell you a couple of those. Well, the first one is that the life history of the barnacle is defined by this fundamental dichotomy between early and late developmental stages. So most of us are perhaps familiar with the volcano-like shape of the barnacle that stucks in rocks and boats and all of those places. But like most crustaceans, barnacles start their uh, start their life cycle looking like this uh, little spaceships in Philadelphia. They just have the capacity to swim, perhaps more aptly drift freely in water columns, including ocean currents. And that fundamentally endows the species with a tremendous capacity for dispersal early on in its life history. Yet, when they are adults, they commit themselves to intertidal ecosystems that are full of idiosyncratic select, uh, selection. So another interesting thing about their life history are the habitats that they recruit into. So in the North Atlantic, the so Nivalis have the capacity to recruit to a very broad vertical spot of the rocky intertidal ranging from the lower intertidal zone to the upper intertidal limit. And for a barnacle, being lucky or choosing, depending on how you think about it, to settle in either of those microhabitats has fundamental consequences for selection. Here I'm showing you a, um, a data set that captures the patterns of thermal variation from sensors placed in the upper intertidal in red or the lower intertidal in red. So tremendous amounts of differences in the regimes of heterogeneity in their experience. And here's the crux of the issue because barnacles actually reproduce within the microhabitats themselves. And what that means is that each offspring will get to inherit whatever alleles are beneficial for their parents. However, because there is this condition of the circle, there is always a chance that those beneficial alleles, now for the offspring, will be deleterious or neutral if they happen to settle in habitats that are in some fundamental way different from that of their parents. That, of course, will lead to a lot of mortality. And then the cycle will repeat again over and over and over every year. There are two consequences to this process. The first consequence is that local adaptation at the level of the microhabitat simply cannot occur because the allelic distributions are recycled every year from scratch. But the second consequence of the system is that because the fitness differences only become visible to selection in the rocky shore, and they have this entire life, uh, uh, life, set, uh, life, sorry, life stage that occurs in the water column, every generation alleles have to engage in this process of spatial tracking where they find themselves as mixed 
in the water column and arguably at the moment of settlement, and the only became become spatially differentiated after settlement has occurred through arguably genotype specific mortality. Now, I want to show you one example to help us contextualize this process a little bit better. And this is the example that comes from one uh, locus, which has been tremendously char well characterized in the species. And this is the Manos 6 phosphate isomerase gene. Now, MPI for short, it's a gene that codes for a protein, which is involved in the process of glycolysis. MPI effectively transforms mannose type sugars into fructose type sugars so that they can be committed to glycolysis. So they have they play an important role in energy generation. Now, mannose is an important sugar for barnacles because out there in the intertidal, a lot of stuff that these creatures are eating is very rich in mannose derivatives. So we could imagine perhaps that genetic variation in a gene like this could have consequences for selection in the intertidal. And in fact, 30 years, maybe 40 years by now, of study in this, in this particular gene has demonstrated, and this is back using allosine technology for those who remember allosine, that at the level of protein electromorphs, there are at least two alleles for this gene. There is an S allele and an F allele. And it turns out that having different numbers of those alleles results in the expression of different phenotypes that have different um, behaviors in response to heat and diet treatments. And like this, there is a large body of literature which has connected um, genetic variation in this gene with the challenges of picture type. There's another interesting bit of information that we should know, and is that the alleles for this gene are spatially distributed in a manner that is quite consistent with this model of spatial adaptive track. Because in the water column, as well as in the moment of settlement, the frequencies of S and F are well mixed. However, if you then genotype this individual after they have fully committed to the intertidal, to the at that point is where you observe that the frequencies of these two alleles are changing and they are becoming spatially differentiated a term which in marine ecology we call sonated. So the allele becomes sonated. And of course, just for sanity, you can do that same analysis in a neutral marker, like a controlled mitochondrial DNA, and you do not observe that pattern, just suggesting that whatever's happening here is idiosyncratic to MPI or something that is linked to MPI. So at this point, I think a lot of the evidence that I've shown you hopefully gives you a sense that this is an interesting target to understand aspects of spatial adaptive tracking. However, a piece of the puzzle, which remained uncharacterized by the time that I started working on this, is the idea that we knew very little about the driver mutations or generally any aspect of nuclear level variation that would underlie the story. And this was, among others, one of the motivations of the work that I did working with uh, David Grant and Brian University. So combined with a phenomenal team of, of genomicists and polygeneticists, including Alejandro, who's here, as well as colleagues from the Marine Marine Genomics Group at the University of Gothenburg, I got to work in this phenomenal system, assembling all sorts of reference genomes and these systems. But I also had the opportunity to travel across the North Atlantic, sampling and sequencing panels of genetic variation for the species. And using those panels, I was able to learn some really interesting things about the genome of the barnacle in general, but also about this particular well characterization. So one of the things that I can show you about this gene is that this gene is special in its own right because for one thing, it is among the most polymorphic genes in the barnacle genome. And then in this particular graph, I'm showing you the summary statistics known as pi, and then pi is the proxy for the amount of genetic variation that we would hope to see in a gene. So in of itself, it's quite notable. However, if we take a closer look at the patterns of genetic variation within the gene, so at the level of exon, we actually observe that this excess of polymorphism is not uniformly distributed across the gene, but rather appears to be concentrated in two regions, one of them in XE4, another one in XE6. So something interesting is happening in these two regions. And I'm going to tell you about one of them. So we can do some follow-up studies, and here this is a cartoon, and this cartoon represents the patterns of nucleotide level variation in this gene associated with whether or not the haplotype produces an S allele or an F allele on the, in the electromorph uh, of um, survey. And if you, play if you play close attention, if you pay close attention to the region that belongs to XC6, 
we know this, that there are two mutations. Well, there's a number of mutations, but two of them are of interest. So they are non synonymous changes, which have a perfect association with expressing the, uh, or creating the F allele or the F allele. And in fact, one of those two mutations, mutation B90, is of note because this is the mutation that transforms a neutral retard glutamine to a positive retard lysine. And for those who remember how allosome electrophoresis work, this is the mutation which underlies all of that interesting variation that I showed you in the introduction. Now, of course, just identifying mutations that drive uh, a variation in gene electrophoresis is not enough to make connections with fitness. But this is a fundamental challenge of working with non-models. So the, close, the, the closest that I was able to get into making hypotheses about the impact of this mutation was to use uh, computer simulations about the three-dimensional folding patterns that we would hope to observe with these two um, haplotypes. And based on those, and these are really exploratory simulations, right? But based on those simulations, there was a lot of predictions that emerged about the, the uh, impact of these simulated mutations and the potential consequences that they may have. So I was not really able to like do additional testing on that, but that's something that I hope to do, hopefully at that approach. So that's just a little sneak peek of something that we've learned by looking at barnacles. But in terms of the general questions that I pursued, for the case of barnacles, a model of adaptive uh, spatial adaptive tracking, I can tell you that there is a lot of evidence that suggests that in the system, after the temperature and diet, drive selection in the system, particularly in the example of MPI. And in terms of the genetic targets of the problem, it seems that the gene itself appears to be an important candidate. And within the gene, these mutations 390 and 343 appear to be major players in the system. So notice I haven't mentioned anything about the interface the model with genetic adaptive tracking, because there's still a lot of work to be done there. But again, I'm really excited to do this in the next stage. Now I want to transition to my second system, which is Drosophila. And for this, once again, I want to ask you to use your imagination and travel with me to And in this case, we're going to the mountains and valleys of central Virginia. This particular place is the Parch Mountain, and that is the beautiful city of Charlotte. And this time, we're looking for a different organism. This charismatic macrofauna, known as Drosophila monogastrum. And I bet you'll find it out here in the orchards, in rotten fruit, or if you're brave, you might be able to find that out here in the compass bin. So all that beautiful biology aside, Drosophila is truly a phenomenal system to ask questions about temporal adaptive tracking. And the reason for that is three components of its life, of its life history. The first one is in uh, North America and Europe, Drosophila monogaster lives in these ecosystems which are fundamentally characterized by seasonality. Right, so spring, summer, fall. So they are highly variable by default. And you combine that with the fact that Monogastric has very fast generation time, but also very short lifespan, you create this very interesting system which, for each particular lineage of the software, each subsequent generation that is born and reproduced gets to exist in an ecological space that is different from one of the from that of their parents, and it will be also different from that of their offspring. So the question is, how does adaptation proceed in this context? How do you maximize the Yeah. Just oh, okay, so I'll try. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll try to. To do this. How does that sound? <laughs> don't, don't move too much. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So there's been a lot of work that has been conducted, sort of capitalizing on this phenomenal biology. And one of the things that we've been able to learn over the past. Okay. okay hold on. Quick pause. Let's go to the, it's the Zoom microphone. Oh, how about there? We'll test, testable hypothesis, right? Okay, so a lot of the work that has been done capitalizing in this biology has been able to show some really interesting patterns that has driven hypothesis generation for at least, well, more than a decade at this point. And the general idea is, sorry, if we measure phenotypes in these organisms, we observe that there are generally two types of phenotypes as a function of season. There are some phenotypes that are involved during the winter, 
and a different set of phenotypes that are involved uh, for dealing with conditions in the summer. And the general hypothesis is that this operates under a phenotypic trait of model, right? Now, from the genetic perspective, again, there's been a lot of work which uh, has been able to characterize the existence of multiple loci across the genome that appear to vary and oscillate following the changes in the system. And the argument, the hypothesis has always been that this right here is the genetic basis for this right here, right? And so if we put that in context, I would argue that where we are right now in terms of a lot of this research is a statement about being able to find this footprint of seasonal adaptations in the genome of Drosophila. However, something which has remained elusive is the fact that we haven't been able to nail down any particular candidate loci to do genotype to phenotype association. And I would argue that that's ultimately one of the central goals that we want to accomplish, right? We want to be able to connect phenotypic and genotypic variation. Now, this is the point in my talk in which um, a lot of people sort of ask me, you know, this is Drosophila, right? Like, why, why is it so difficult about working with Drosophila? Just find the genes. And there is a reason why this, this candidate loci have remained elusive. And it's actually a combination of a couple of things. For one thing, when we think of seasonality, it is very common for us to contextualize this process as this, just the change in, in, in selection pressures as the time progress, and, and that is true. However, this occurs in parallel with a second process, which is equally important. And it is the fact that as the seasons progress, the demographic properties of Drosophila populations are changing. So if we were to sample wild fruit flies in, in the spring at the beginning of the growing season, you would actually find that, in the, that Drosophila exists in relatively isolated patches of small density. And if you were to sequence their genomes, you'll see some signs of inbreeding, right? So clearly not the admixed swarms that we hope to see. However, if you wait for the harvest to start and then resources become a plenty, and then you sample those populations again, then you actually observe that those populations have now exploded in, in, in size and density. They merge into this quasi panamictic swarm. They go everywhere. They get in your house. This is pretty much how you get to experience yourself. However, once the harvest is done, those resources disappear, populations then crash, they experience severe bottlenecks, and then whoever survives that bottleneck enters diapause, and then overwinters to repeat the cycle again every year. So the problem of finding these markers is that there is a fundamental confounding effect between the process of seasonal selection and the process of seasonal demography. And we need to be very creative about the ways in which we disentangle those two to find the genes that are actually contributing to responses to selection in the system. Now to tackle that challenge, um, I've, had, I've had the, the pleasure of working with a phenomenal team of people, um, many of them belonging to Alan Bergman's lab at the University of Virginia, but many of them actually part of the Drosophila Consortium for uh, Population Genetics, DrosU. And then uh, together, we've put together this uh, very cool publicly available data set, so anyone here could use it if you wanted to. And this is known as the Drosophila evolution over phase in time. And what this data set consists of is, I mean, it's mostly full seek, but I think we want to add some more data uh, um, in the next iterations. It is uh, genetic data for multiple populations across Europe and North America sampling the same populations multiple times within a year and also across multiple years. So we've generated this phenomenal system to tackle this kind of questions. And a little sort of point of pride is that we, uh, we published this data set earlier uh, last year for this year. Uh, we, we got the, the cover of the new system. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> okay, so what can we do with this data? Well, we can analyze this at different levels. And for issues of simplicity and also time, the analysis that I wanna share primarily comes from the population in Charlottesville, but later on, I'm gonna to try to show you that there's some aspect of generality for this. And so if we take the data, we can use dimensionality reduction like the PCA, and then we can just see what signal emerges from the different chromosomes. So right here, I'm showing you three chromosome arms. Each one of the dots represents a library that is sequenced. And the color represents the year from which that panel, that library was sequenced. 
And I hope that just by looking at this plot, the first thing that jumps to your attention is that the ordination of those samples in principal component space appears to follow some component of the time progression, right? So there is temporal structure in the data. The argument I want to submit to you is that this is not an artifact of, of the data set, but rather a reflection of a biological reality. And that are those overwintering cycles that I described to you earlier. So the data is, is revealing that to, to us. Now, of course, this is a testable hypothesis. So we can take advantage of the structure of the desk data set, right? The fact that we have samples that send those 10 generations within a year, but then because we have multiple years of sampling, we also have samples that span that overwintering boundary. And remember, this is two generations, this is 10 generations. So we can use a statistic like the FST, and just a reminder that FST is a proxy for the amount of linear differentiation. Values close to zero means that things are very similar. Values close to one means that things are, things are very different. And so we can use that statistic, and then we can ask the question, well, if we compare FST within a growing season versus across the growing season, the question is, is the FST of the overwintering boundary greater, equal, or lower? And the hypothesis for overwintering effects uh, being an important player here is that this should be much higher, even though it's only two generations. And then if we conduct that analysis, we notice that the data of Charlottesville, but not just Charlottesville, but also another population in which we conducted this analysis, generally complies with the expectation that uh, perturbations of a little frequency across this boundary are strong enough to generate a much higher FSC over winter than relative to within the growing season. So the argument is these bottlenecks are important. They are important drivers of standing genetic variation in the species. So when to think about this, when we think about seasonality. All right. Notice, however, that one of the panels is missing. That is another of the, chromos of the chromosomal arms of the structural that that arm 2L chromosomal arm 2L. And something funky is happening in chromosomal arm 2L, 2L right? Because the vast majority of the genome is, re is revealing this temporal structure, which is sort of consistent with population structure, with drift, right? At the, at the temporal level. Then something else is happening in chromosomal arm 2L. And, and that's peculiar to us, right? Something to note is that chromosome 2L is the home of one of the many, many cosmopolitan inversions in Drosophila. In this context, the inversion just to remind you means a change in the, in the arrangement of genes in chromosome, and cosmopolitan just means that we find that everywhere. And the inversion that lives in chromosome 12 is called, it's called diagonal. So we can do a series of association analysis, and then we can discover that the only inversion that appears to drastically alter the projections in the PC analysis in our data is the frequency of ion 2 t which of course drastically alter the projections of chromosome 12. So something's happening with this inversion that is creating a signal that is really easy for us to capture in that PCA. And here is where we looked at precedent because it's not the first time that IN2LT has appeared in our analysis. In fact, over the past couple iterations of this analysis, it's always been the case that chromosome 2L, in particular this inversion, has given us hints of being a hotspot for seasonal adaptation. And it could be that now that we have this massive data set, we might be able to finally test the hypothesis that chromosome 2L may actually be this massive hotspot of the seasonality uh, um, process. This is not a crazy hypothesis, by the way. There's been a lot of work which has taken advantage of simulation frameworks and population genetics theory to argue that chromosomal inversions, because of its evolutionary properties, are great candidates to facilitate adaptation to highly variable environments. And even if we look at empirical cases, right, in systems like Litherina snail or Anopheles mosquitoes, there is evidence that suggests that inversions are very important players in adaptation to changing environments. So how are we going to go ahead and test this hypothesis? Well, we can take advantage of another publicly available resource, and this is the NASA Power Project data set. NASA Power is this phenomenal data set that contains meteorological information uh, for decades of a large number of places around the planet. And then we can mine that data set to match those meteorological records with each one of the sites that we have in the test data set, right? And then with that data in hand, we can then engage in a process of summarizing that data 
to try to capture different aspects of seasonality, right? And I know that what is seasonality? Well, that's, that's we can debate that. But that's this is what we're gonna do. So for example, we can take the mean temperature, the day of collection, the month prior to collection, or say nine days, three months prior to collection. And we can engage in different schemes of summarizing the data and then use that to test a variety of models. So we're gonna now combine these meteorological data with our genetics information. And then we can ask the question, well, for each mutation in the genome, we're gonna to try to describe changes of genetic variation, changes in the frequency, as a function of a term that captures some aspect of population structure in time, so temporal structure, plus a term that captures aspects of this environmental variable. We can fit that model, and then we can compare the output of that model with a much simpler model that just tries to capture variation as a function of the population structure effect, the temporal structure effect. And then we're gonna do that for the real configuration of the data, as well as uh, for 100 permutations, and these permutations try to retain some aspects of linkage in the genome. Now, the results of that model fitting exercise are very interesting. So here, each one of those gray lines represents a different model that we tested. On the y-axis, it is a, a, some metric of AIC enrichment related to permutations. And then the general pattern that we observe for most of the genome is one where the null model, this is a model where you only fit genetic variation as a function of the intercept, is it always underperforms, so that's good, right? But then generally speaking, the best model that explains changes in genetic variation is this purple, which we call the year model, but this is the, uh, the, the temporal structure model. And this is true if you fit the analysis for all of these autosomal arms, whether or not the, your sampling mutation from inside cosmopolitan inversions or outside cosmopolitan inversions. Because remember, all chromosomes in Drosophila have cosmopolitan inversions, right? This is not just a, a 2L thing. But if we look at the results from chromosome 2L, there we see something interesting, which is that the model that better capture or, or the, the model that best fit value, those patterns of variation in the data is not the temporal model, is the model that summarizes the temperature maximum zero to 15 days prior to collection. And this is true inside and outside the inversion. So again, this is consistent. So this is consistent where we saw in the PCA, but this is consistent with the idea that some aspects of temperature are driving allele frequency change in this chromosome, particularly in the DNA. We became really excited about this, so we took a closer look. Okay, so here, on the x-axis, I'm going to show you the genomic position inside chromosome 12. The dashed lines here represent the boundaries of the inversion, so the breakpoints. And then on the y-axis, I'm going to show you a p-value, and that p-value corresponds to the output of an enrichment test, asking the question whether or not there are more or less mutations than expected, seasonal mutations in this case, relative to some null model. And so if we look at the data, just at face value, we see that there is something really interesting happening inside the inversion. So that's cool, that's exciting. But to assess whether or not this is interesting, uh, we want to overlay the permutation on top. And that's the permutations. So if we look at the, at the behavior of permutations versus real data, we start noticing that there are regions inside the inversion that are very strongly enriched for the seasonal mutations, right? And now these six windows that I have highlighted here are now our regions of interest, right? But at this point, I have to stop and remind you that all of this data is really just fitting the Charlottesville population data, right? And so that leads us to the question, have we discovered something generalizable or is this just idiosyncratic to the Charlottesville population? And this is where DEST once again comes to the rescue. Because we have a ton of data, not just for North America, but also for European populations. And right here, what I'm showing you is that in Europe, Melanogaster has two um, population clusters based on phylogeography. There is a, a Western cluster and an Eastern cluster. And so we can repeat this analysis at the level of these two clusters and then ask the question, do we see the same patterns of enrichment in the Virginia data versus the European data? And so right here is um, an enriched, the output of an enrichment test. L and R represent the left and right breakpoints of the inversion. And then these W categories are just different windows. So two things jump to our attention. The first one is that there are a couple windows, right? Particularly near the six area and the four area 
and I can tell you what those are after the fact. So please ask me about those windows that, take, that are not enriched in Europe. So whatever's happening there is idiosyncratic to North America. But the breakpoints and in, in these other three windows are enriched both in Virginia as well as Europe. So the hypothesis here is that we have stumbled upon something which is generalizable across the habitat. So that really uh, emboldened us to then ask the next question, which is, well, are any of these things connected to phenotypes in any meaningful way? And again, this is the beauty of working with your software, right? So to try to take a sneak peek at phenotypic associations, we took advantage of yet another publicly available data set. In this case, the DGRP, the Drosophila Genetics Reference Panel. And this is a panel that consists of more than 200 input lines. They derived originally from Raleigh, North Carolina. But by this point, all of those lines have been extensively genotyped and extensively karyotyped and used in a large number of whole genome association studies for GWAS. And so what we've done, this is done in collaboration with graduate students at Alan Burkle's lab, is that we've conducted a meta-analysis of many of these GWAS studies to try to understand the ways in which different mutations across the genome contribute to different phenotypes. And after doing that, we end up with two data sets. There is one data set that tells us a story about the seasonal mutations. And then there is another data set that now tells us something about the contributions of individual mutations to phenotypes of interest. And then we can then look at the overlap of those two data sets. So how many mutations, which are seasonal mutations in your data set, are associated in some form with any of the GWAS analysis? And we can do that in sort of a sliding window analysis. And then if we do that, we observe that there's a lot of regions um, near or inside the inversion that are enriched for mutations that are both seasonal as well as contributing to the phenotype. And there's one region in particular that I want to call your attention to, which is there's a very strong enrichment here in window 5.1 associated with one gene, that gene is MSP300. And I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute. So do keep that in your mind. But we can also do something else, which is now that we have regions across the inversion that are enriched for phenotypes, we can then go to the DGRP and get those phenotypes and extract the phenotypic values for each one of those lines. And then we can do another PCA, but this is a phenotype level PCA. And if we do that, we observe that those phenotypes appear to generate two general clusters of phenotypes based on their value, right? So when, when the value of one line is high, but then the value of the other one is low, right? So like we're seeing here clusters. And then those clusters have two general sort of groupings of phenotypes. In PC1 over here, we see a lot of phenotypes associated with the and chemical resistance on that side. And then on this side, things related to lifespan and activity levels. Okay, so that's really exciting. Right? We haven't done anything, we've just done a PC on the data. We can then annotate these projections relative to whether or not the lines have, are homozygous for the inversion or, or homozygous for the standard. And if we see that, we observe that those two clusters are primarily driven by whether or not you are homozygous for the inversion or the standard. And what we've noticed here is that the data itself has generated the phenotypic trait of model. Because if we look at the levels of allele frequency of the inversion, the inversion is most common in the summer, and then DGRP lines, so, sorry, the standard is more common in the summer, and DGRP lines with the standard have high fecundity and high chemical risk. The inversion, on the other hand, is most common in the summer, right? So it's less common in the winter, more common, more, uh, sorry, less common in the summer, most common in the winter. And those lines have high activity phenotypes and high geotaxis. And yet, this is another beauty of Drosophila. We are now in the process of building transgenic lines to test this hypothesis. So, and I really cannot go into detail for issues of time, but we have built deficiency lines and we have tested whether or not lines with deficiencies in inverted karyotypes or standard karyotypes show of different phenotypes. And this is, as R here is cell response, so it's an activity phenotype. We do observe that inverted lines do have higher activity relative to standard lines. So our experimental validations show that these phenotypes behave as they should. So this is extremely cool in various dynamics. The last thing that I wanna show you is I wanna go back to that interesting candidate, that, this, that, that, that region that, whose enrichment is driven by that gene MSP300. So MSP300, the name of that gene is the muscle-specific protein of 300 kilodalton. 
in Drosophila, there's been a lot of work that shows that this gene is involved in muscle, particularly in the proper positioning of muscle nuclei, mitochondria, near, near, near muscular junctions. So really cool phenotypes. And in our data set, when we look closer, uh, when we look closely at that particular region, we found that there was one mutation that was extremely interesting to us. One mutation in particular, it's among the most seasonal mutations, and that just has to mean with that the score in the analysis is really high. And that mutation happened to be a non-synonymous mutation that changes a glycine to a valine. And the mutation itself happens to be located in an exon that it's known to be differentially spliced on the different contexts. So just at that point, there's already a lot of really interesting biology that we could test in the future. But this is not the reason why I'm showing you this mutation. The reason why this mutation called to our attention is because when we did a sort of phylogenetic angle to the analysis and we extracted information from the Akuba, Simulans, and Tichelia, including that with Melanogaster, what we see is that our favorite seasonal mutation is not just a polymorphism in Melanogaster, it's a transspecies polymorphism that segregates in Seychellia as well as in Simulans. And it, this blows our mind in multiple ways because Simulans is a seasonal species, but not in the same way that Melanogaster is. Season, uh, so Simulans is also a cosmopolitan species, but it goes locally extinct every year. And there's something about Tichelia, it's, it's like a private species in, in a corner of the world. So something interesting is happening here. And hopefully some of the work that we'll do in the future will allow us to try to understand what, what, what's happening here. Okay, so now I want to summarize this a little bit. Um, in terms of the interplay of demography and adaptive tracking, it really appears to be the case that these overwintering dynamics are a fundamental piece of the puzzle to understand standing genetic variation in the species. In terms of the drivers of adaptive tracking, um, it seems that aspects of temperature are very important to understand selection in response to seasonality. And then in terms of the targets, well, this inversion just flares up in our analysis. So, so inversions are, that inversion is probably important. And then we have identified one particular gene that we'd like to do some follow-up studies on. Okay, at this point, I would like to close my talk by telling you some reflections, some things that have sparked conversation upon seeing this data. And the first one has to do with that idea of adaptive tracking as a ubiquitous process, because I think that there is more and more data coming up in, in sort of recent genomic analysis that provides support to that idea that adaptive tracking, just rapid adaptation in general, might be a very ubiquitous process out there in the wild. And that adaptive inversions may in fact be very important players in that process, right? And that connects back to a lot of the early work of the Jans just in the 21st century. Another thing which has sparked a little bit of debate among, so when we look at this data, is some of those fundamental assumptions that we make about the role of selection vis-a-vis -vis the standard model. I mean, I think it's often assumed that evolution is a very slow process, primarily governed by drift, that selection, selection is rare, and that when it happens, it mostly reduces variation. Yet, if, if this hypothesis continues to gain support, what it may signify is that selection may actually be a much more common process than we originally think, and that it in of itself has the capacity to maintain and promote the maintenance of genetic variation in nature. And that will help us explain many patterns that we see out there in the wild that to this, to this day have remained uh, under study or unexplained. And the idea is we just need to know where to look for and what to look for. Okay, with that, I cannot say goodbye to you without recognizing the work and contributions to a large number of people that have been fundamental for this research. David Rand and Brown with the Barnacle Project, Alan Brown in Virginia with the, with the Drosophila Project. And then I want to recognize the funding sources. And if there's any time left, I want to say thank you to you. And please feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Great. So I have a few minutes for questions. Um, this one for questions? Okay. Yeah, yeah, there might be some Zoom questions as well. We can turn on the chat. Okay, I'll take a look at the chat. So I'm looking at the chat. No. So the question is, is IN2LT present in other Drosophila species? And the answer is no. So Drosophila, the, the phylogenetics of Drosophila has Drosophila in one. Well, actually, I can show you this. So, oh, one minute. 
So Drosophila, this is the phylogeny. Oh, there's now a bit of a, oh, here it is. This is the phylogenetic tree of Drosophila. So the sister species of Melanogaster is simulans. And simulans is primarily inversion free. So Melanogaster has inversions in every chromosome and they are cosmopolitan. This is not true of simulans. So, so this particular inversion is only seen in Melanogaster. But the argument is that inversions in general appear to be important players in adaptation to oceanic environments. Okay, good. Um, back then? yeah yeah so I'll, I'll see if i can synthesize the question so your question is about are those elevated levels of genetic variation that we associate with genes involved in adaptive tracking a result of the fact of maintaining alleles with conditional fitness, right? And you're maintaining both of those in the population or is that high level of genetic variation due to something else, right? Is that, is that, is that the question? Yeah, I mean, like, let me think about it. I mean, there's a lot of layers to that question. That, that's a very interesting question. I think it's that. Um, so in the model, in the first slide that I showed you that model from Botero, one of those things that that model establishes is that the expected type of genetic architecture that we should hope to see ultimately depend on idiosyncratic natural conditions of the species. So if you, if you ask this question of a polar bear, you wouldn't be seeing what we see in Drosophila. Right? But like Drosophila has aspects of his life history that make it conducive to the maintenance of this, of this polymorphisms, right? Now, that's actually a very difficult question. Now, so I'm gonna give you the answer for Drosophila, which is that the argument here, oh no, not the argument, the hypothesis here is that the high levels of genetic diversity result from the action of marginal overdominance, which is a type of natural selection. And what that means is that one of those good in the summer, one allele is good in the winter, and then you want to conserve those two alleles, right? And then the maintenance of those two alleles is what drives that elevated level supply, right? Um, but there are other competing hypotheses, right? Like you could make the argument that this is just frequency dependent selection, this is just heterosis that is being kicked out of equilibrium every uh, uh, every every winter because of that overwintering dynamic. And then ultimately our goal to get closer at testing each one of those hypotheses is through the phenotyping experiment, right? Like we, we're now building these transgenic lines now that we have some targets, and then we're going to try to use different aspects of experimental manipulations to see if either of those hypotheses has more or less support. But the argument is that, yes, like it is that conditional nature of those two alleles that drives the, the elevated nature of pi, as opposed to what you would expect, which is selection would, would, would remove variation, which might be the case for the polar bear, right? But, but not so much, which, which is seeking a more like optimal plastic solution to this versus Drosophila, who seems to evolve under adaptive tracking. Yeah, question. Yeah. So in your um, fermentation task across the whole chromosome, it seems like the actual fermentation uh, data like, track really well those peaks mm -hmm. variation, except for very narrow points, and even show higher value within the inversion side. Yeah. So uh, what was exactly the, the variable across that what being Bermuda and why did this happen? That's a great question. So remember that we're doing a large number of permutations of the real data. And this data has inherent properties that relate to reality. So sometimes just by chance, you can end up with permuted sets that are very similar to the real set. 
right? So like another way to do this, which is what I want to do, is I want to use Lin to simulate a neutral background informed by the real architecture of the, of, of, of the species and then compare the real data with simulation sets. And that is, that's on the topic. That's something that I plan to do. But for this particular analysis that I showed you, we're just permuting the real data. Sometimes you end up with an arrangement of the data that is quasi random, but sometimes you end up with like summer, summer lines and, and winter lines end up clustered. And then it produces a signal that is similar to the real data. But then the beauty of those signals is that, of those peaks is that they beat 100% of the permutations, right? Our, our six windows of interest were selected because they beat every single permutation uh, set. So what does it mean to you? The association between allelic state and the label of collection. So what, you know, you have ACTG and then it's like summer, winter, summer, winter, and then you shuffle that. So it's the association between when you collected them and the allelic state, yeah. The allelic state, yeah. Is that, is that uh, this is actually, so this is different. So what this shows is, you mean the top panel? Yeah. That shows whether or not, so if you look for mutations that are both, that are both significantly contributing to a GWAS, but that they're also significantly um, uh, uh, sort of tagged in the seasonal analysis, you find those mutations all across the chromosome, right? Because these are like highly pathogenic things. But that graph asks the question, are there windows that have more mutations that are both than expected under some binomial model, right? So, th so that is simply, and then the permutations there is permutations, it's permutations of that um, association between, is it that you're permuting both data sets, right? The, the, the seasonal as well as the genus set. So you're, you're making this way straight. It is something that I mean, we, we could look specifically at the code for that because I, I want to give you a, a correct answer for that, but that sounds about right. So, mm -hmm. um, Questions? Okay. And yeah, go for it. So one one low level here is how uh, do you how do you you know so um obviously there are a lot of problems with folks among IOs who are I and who are when you get into like that, there are many sets of equilibrium within a class saying chromosome one. In the R, yes. Not chromosome one, but in in the arm, yes, that's correct. So, how do you deal with that? And so, for instance, how do you deal with this fact that that they say all of this correlation structure that's influencing the two options? Yeah. Well, sorry. So the answer has to do with how do you deal with all of the correlation structure that influence the GWAS? That's a very interesting question, and the answer is most people just don't. Most people use genetic relatedness matrix. It's, well, yeah, G -G -G is even worse than that. They just ignore it completely. Right. Well, the answer is we, well, so we have a couple sets of, very, of, of, of data. And one of them is the um, individual data where we can ask the specific linkage with the breakpoints with, with interesting mutations. But I think your question is about the GWAS, which is how do we control for the existence of the inversion in the GWAS? Is that right? Um, and then, well, the answer is we argue that the existence of the inversion is um, sort of a fundamental part of the data when you're looking for the GWAS, right? So when, when you do the association, you can actually ask the question whether or not one particular line of the DGRP is more or less associated with the phenotype, right? And then that gives you that enrichment. So we basically, and I'm happy to talk about this later, but we have not used a, a, a genome related matrix to control for this, because if you do, you completely remove the impact of the inversion. So you don't get any signal here. Right, control, I mean, that's gonna be the major access to the very as well. Right, but the, but the argument, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So scaffolding tracking yeah. generally is kind of interesting. And I, I, I bristle a little bit at that 
frame, particularly with respect to, um, well, for both these things. So I'm going to ask you this question. Yeah. Is it that it's backward just due to the specific mortality? You could argue that it is. So why do we have a special name? Why do we have a special lens for things? I mean, look, so I think I think that adaptive tracking tries to establish a type of natural selection in which you maximize your fitness as a function of genotype specific, sorry, of context specific fitness, right? So it's just simply, it describes the process of species having to evolve in rapid bursts to keep up with the environment, right? And it tries to differentiate it from other processes like say frequency dependent selection, in which in that case, Populations evolve as a function of the state of the population in a prior time. So one implies a direct consequence of the environment versus some other function of the population. So I'm happy to talk about the semantics of adaptive fracking. Where is the Well, that's that's a very good question. So, like, you know, I think that when you think about plasticity or bed hedging, there is very clearly something that evolves. There is a property of things that evolve, right? But like, here's the thing: like adaptation, right? If you think of as the thing that you use to maximize your fitness, right? In this particular case, adaptive adaptive tracking is the strategy that you use to maximize your fitness. The particular adaptations in that context, it's almost a semantic point. You, yeah, I mean, you, you may disagree with me, but it's like, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's chat. <laughs> Hopefully, there is a visitor coming from Great and Pacific. We uh, I think the graph of person is probably there right 